Needless to say, I have so many things to tell you, but you can't accept them now, yeah? How about when he, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth, is that the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Okay. The spirit of truth is come, he will guide you unto all truth. Yeah? For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, what was it? Wasn't it? That, shall, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it, uh, it unto you. So, yeah, unto all you. things that the Father has of mine. So is that, is that what? Yeah, I think this should be sufficient. So, yeah. do you believe that is the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Yeah. And is Holy Spirit God, according to you? Yeah. Even in that passage, yeah, he's referring to, to say. It's all masculine terms. No, it doesn't he matter even come. if it's yeah, he even if it's masculine. The but the question he is, shall come. he shall show you. He, these are all speaking about a masculine person, not the Holy Spirit. So, when he says here, what, what's your name, my friend? What's your name? Kondwani. Kon? Kondwani. Kondwani? Okay. So when he says here, for he shall not speak himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. If Holy Spirit is God according to you, why can't he speak without being told what to say? Can you imagine? Can you speak by yourself without someone telling you what to say? Do you have the independence? Yes? To speak by yourself. So, if you have the ability to speak by yourself, freely, independently, do you think that is something that the Holy Spirit will not have the ability to do? It does, it does, it does, it does. So, but he says here, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall speak, for he shall not speak himself. Yeah? But whatever he shall hear, that he will speak. So he's not speaking himself, it's saying here. But whatever he hears, means he hears from the Father, from God Almighty, only that he will speak. So he has, he doesn't have the independence which you as a human being have, or I as a human being have, where we can freely speak independently without, without being dependent on anyone to tell us what to say and when to say it. So how is it possible that this Holy Spirit, which is one of the persons of the Trinity, doesn't have the ability to even speak independently? But he will only say what he hears. He says it very clearly. He will not speak of his, of, uh, by himself. But whatever he shall hear, uh, hear, only that he will speak. You can look for yourself if you want. It's in John chapter 16, verse number 13. You can read it aloud if you want. That's all the proof. Is that the I think that's the King James version, yeah? But all the versions, all the different versions have the same text, more or less the same message. Yeah. Or multiply, that's true. Peace be upon you. That's all the evidence about. Why didn't get like a new English translation? Huh? That's like a very, very old English one. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. That's, that's why. Yeah, that's, that's why you see like, that. You see like when Christians speak. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I can't hear you. You see like when Christians speak. Yeah. What? Sorry, when Christians speak? Like, like the Holy Spirit. Yeah. There's a certain difference in their tone. Like, Sorry, difference certain, between whom? Yeah, their tone. That's why they, they hear things like. No, not like not like actually hearing a voice, but like they feel that. Okay, let's that's let's start with a simple question. Yeah. Can the Holy Spirit speak independently? No, as you said, it comes from the Father. So he has to be told what to say from God the Father. Yeah, that's why it's the Holy Spirit of God is so different, it's one. It's like Jesus is one. Yeah, I know they're different. I know I know the Father is different from the Son and the Son is different from the Holy Spirit. They're distinct. I have no doubt about that. However, the Christians claim that they are they are one. So they even though they are distinct, they are one. But I'm saying about if they are independent, if each person of the Trinity is independent in the ability to even speak. Yes? Because to me, a God who cannot speak independently is not really Almighty God. No, that's why he comes, he comes in different ways. doesn't matter what way he comes in. But if he doesn't have the ability to speak, in any way he comes, it's regardless because a God who is Almighty should at least have the ability to speak independently without being told what to say. Are you with me? 
just like you 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 can speak independent like right now you're speaking to me right no one is forcing you or compelling you to speak something that you don't want to speak or something that even if you want even if you willed it that it's your own will it's not somebody else's will you see what i mean now how is it possible that the holy spirit cannot speak by itself if he's almighty god now this is something that and and the other thing is that it's the same with jesus christ you know that it's not, it's not. jesus christ was jesus, commanded what to say yeah but if they are one why is it that the father is the one who can always independently speak but then the son and the holy spirit are commanded what to say it's not it's not the same you see what i mean how are they one tell me we know they're distinct T tell me how are they one show me anywhere in the entire bible old testament or new testament where it says the different persons of the trinity are one or god manifests as three persons yeah where does it say the trinity in there because to me that's only talking about the father it's not talking about all three of them that is the assumption you're making so you need to prove it from your bible that this is what the Shema actually means it's in Deuteronomy 6 4 Shema Israelu Adonai Elohinu Adonai Ahad. Yes? So when the Jewish people read this Shema, when Moses reads the Shema, he did not tell these people that these are the three persons of the Trinity which form one God. That was in the preaching of Moses, or even Abraham before him, or even the people after him, or even Jesus Christ himself. Did you ever hear Jesus Christ ever? preach to the people that God manifests as three persons, ever. It doesn't always say it, but like he, he says it always, like, notice how the New Testament He also said saying, Jesus was there with God at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, let him, let him finish. Go on, say. Just know it's always saying, I am the Father of God. If you do, I don't do my own will, not the Father's will. Yeah, he also says, I am the, he also says, I am the disciples of one, John 17, 22. Read it and it's in your Bible. Yeah, read it from John 17. John, same chapter. John, open chapter 17, verse number 22. You want me to open it for you? Okay. I think that's John 16, isn't it? 17. Oh, 17. Yeah, good. Handle it's already open for us. Yeah, we got the page right here. Can you read it loud. You want me to read it for you? And you know. You know, therefore, have sorrow. I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy is no man take it from you. Is that 22? Yeah. Okay, maybe it's 21. Then. 21. Uh, a woman, when she is travelled, has sorrow, but her hour is come. But as soon as she's delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish. Well, hold on. I think you're. Let me just look at it. John 17. Oh, that's John 17. Yeah, it's over here. Yeah, you're you're reading in the wrong place here. Yeah. John 16. Oh, yeah, I've got the chapter. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. 22 hours, right? Uh, Read aloud. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. So, who is they? The disciples, yeah? So that they may be one just as we are one. So you remember in, he quoted John 10, 30, where he says, I and the Father are one. So that is established. Now we hear Jesus saying, I give the glory that you gave me, yes? So that you may be one just like I and the Father are one. So now how many gods have you got? 15? It's 12 plus 3, right? What does that say? We see your friend today. They are the disciples. The apostles. He also says, Holy Spirit. No, no, no. I'm not asking who gave him the disciples. I'm asking you, the day over there is referring to the apostles. You want to read the one before that if you want? That's fine. Read aloud. So, so no, no, no. Hmm? He, he slept with his two daughters. So let's, let's not go there, bro. Yeah, no, no. We don't want to mix too many topics. No, he was saying earlier yeah. that Lord isn't a prophet. That's why he did that. Is that. What's the Christian belief in that? That's another God being event, isn't it? David is not a prophet. Yeah, but, oh, okay. He's obviously like okay. lack of knowledge. No, that's fine. That's fine. It's okay. We don't want to. The Christian belief is normally Lord is a prophet. We expect certain people not to have. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Even if they're Christian. So you you know they are one now, yeah? So what the only the only way you can make sense of this is 
they are one in purpose. Okay, not one in essence. Yes, like it says elsewhere in the Old Testament, when a man marries a woman, they become one flesh. But we know that they are not one flesh literally, are they? Yes. Yeah, because when they become divorced, then what? You have two flesh now again. Yes, but they always two flesh anyway. So there are certain things which you have to take metaphorically, not literally. So when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, he doesn't mean literally in that sense. Just like Jesus says, I and the disciples are one in John 17, 22. Yes, just like you, you and I are one, they also may be one with us. And this is quite clear. I mean, there are many such passages where you have to realize that Jesus, whenever he's preaching to the people, he has always been subordinate to God Almighty. He was never co-equal with God Almighty. So when you say I and the Father are one, that is not a co-equality. It is talking about one in purpose. That means they all have the same purpose. Remember, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Yes? What was his purpose? To show the people the way. What, what is the way? The way to whom? To God Almighty. He's the way. Remember, he's not the destination. He's the way to Almighty he's God. Way, yes. yes, and he's the truth. That means what he preaches is the truth. So what was he preaching? Has he ever preached the Trinity? During all the three years or three and a half years, whatever his ministry was, did he ever preach the Trinity? Never. He doesn't, doesn't like actually say it. Why not? If that was one of your most important doctrines, yes? Remember when Jesus was asked what is the most important commandment, what did he respond to that? Love the God with all your hearts and strength. Exactly. Why did he not say the Trinity? You see what I mean? So Jesus never explicitly preached the Trinity. In fact, he explicitly states that the only true God is the Father. If the only true God is the Father, then it excludes everyone else. You see what I mean? If I said you're the only one who has a backpack here, okay, that means no one else has a backpack here. If I said that, if I made that statement. However, the testimony of Jesus Christ outweighs everyone else. So it doesn't matter what John 1, 1 says or what uh, the I am uh, verses that you have in John again says the very statement that Jesus makes in again John 17 Alhamdulillah we still have that open okay look at John 17 3 and you tell me what Jesus means by that yeah, if you don't mind just read it aloud so we can all hear and this is life eternal that they might know you the only true God and Jesus Christ who you are sent yeah. So you know who the they is, that, sorry, that they might know you, you know who's a you there? Read, read the first verse in John 17, 1. It tells you that. Which one, which one? John 17, 1. First, verse number one. Number one. That's John 17. Yeah. yeah. So that's read the first, the first verse over there. So he's, he's praying. He's what spoke Jesus. Yeah. Read aloud. These words spoke Jesus and lift up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son and your son also may glorify you. Mm -hmm. As you have given him power over the flesh, all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Yeah. So he's speaking to the Father, right? He's yeah. praying to the Father. Now, in, in, in the words that you just read, the one after that, verse 3, that this is eternal life, that they may know you. The you there is the Father. So the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So according to Jesus Christ, who is the only true God? No, no. Him and the Father are one brain. No, we already discussed that, he my friend. Says, we have I'm moved the, on now. I'm the only way to the Father. Yeah, he's saying. not a destination, you're right. I agree with you, he's the way. Every prophet is the way to God Almighty. And Jesus is no exception. But Jesus is not a prophet. Yeah, well, he did say he's a prophet. He acknowledged that he's a prophet. How? The people acknowledge that he's a prophet. Jesus is different. And he's a Messiah. He's a chosen one of God. Okay? We as Muslims, we accept that. Do you know that? We are the Jews. We accept him and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Yes? But in, in that verse which you just read, this is eternal life that they may know you, the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He makes a clear distinction between the only true God and the Christ. And himself. You see what I mean? So when Jesus himself if testifies... If he's different, why, why do we need Jesus to get to the Father? Because like I said, every prophet... You know, God, God said that anyone who sees him will die. So God cannot just come here and tell people I'm God. Yes, because it's a test. This life is a test. There won't be much of a test if God comes and presents himself and then tells everyone I'm God. Because obviously when they see the glory of God, first and foremost, they will all die. Alright? 
So we need, what did God do? What did God do throughout history? He always sends messengers and prophets to tell them and to teach, to teach his people, yes, how they can worship God, how they can have salvation, and how they can uh, pray to God and other, other laws as well. So these were all delivered by God to the prophets and the prophets then delivered it to his people. You see what I mean? So the uh, God Almighty elects who are the prophets that he is going to use to deliver his message. Yes? And this is the same in Islam. So when I say messenger, I mean even the angels. So even amongst men and amongst angels, it is God Almighty who decides whom he wants to elect to deliver his message. See what I mean? So Jesus was a messenger for us. He's a prophet of God. He's a Messiah. All three. Why is that in, in the Quran? He's like, it's different. It's sin, isn't it? Say again? In the Quran, he sins. Who sins? No, Jesus. in the Quran, he doesn't sin. In the Bible, he sins, actually. So why is in the Quran Jesus come back? Say again? Jesus come back in the Quran and the Bible. Yeah, so we are talking about the second coming now. That's a different topic, my, my friend. Let's decide first who real God is, who the true God is. Let's decide that before we move on to the second coming of Jesus. So according to Jesus Christ, based on what you read, who is the only true God? And be, be sincere, because that is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yes? I don't want to know what you say or what anybody else says, who, Jesus Christ, or who the true God is. I want to know what Jesus Christ himself acknowledges as the true God. Who is it according to that statement? According to that testimony of his, who is the only true God? Yahweh, Jesus Christ. Yahweh, Jesus Christ. There's no Yahweh mentioned that. Why did you just lie, bro? There's no mention of Yahweh in the entire New Testament. Why didn't you just say the Father? Yes, as it is in there. Why do you have to invent words and put in your own translation and interpretation when it's very clear over there, when it's explicit? You see, this is a problem not just with you, but with many Christians. When there's explicit passages, you ignore it. When there are implicit ones like I and the Father are one, you want to adopt that as a literal translation. Why? Look at the explicit, interpret it as such. Look at the metaphorical and interpret those as such. You do not, you use, in fact, the, uh, uh, the right way to interpret things is you use explicit passages to interpret the ambiguous ones. That's the correct principle. Not the other way around. When Jesus says the only true God is the Father, who are you and I to say otherwise? You see what I mean? He's teaching us, he's teaching us, like he even teaches us how to pray to the Father. Exactly my, friend, my point. He never taught you to pray to the Trinity, did he? He taught you to pray only to the Father. Very good point, my brother. So you see, by your own admission, you're saying Jesus taught to pray only to the Father. Whom do you pray to, by the way? Pray, no, when you say God, whom do you pray to? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, or only the Father? I say our Father, I pray, and I say in Jesus' name, Amen. That's yeah, but you you direct your prayers only to the Father, or all to the to the Trinity? Whom do you direct it to? Come on. I pray, I pray to the Father. Exactly. Why do you only pray to the Father? Why did Jesus pray only to the Father? No, said, why did the disciples pray only to the Father? You know why I say in Jesus' name? Because I need Jesus to get to the Father. That's why I say in Jesus' name. Well, that's just a middleman. You need Jesus as a middleman, as an intermediary. Yes? You see, as a Muslim, I can pray directly to Allah. I don't need an inter I don't need to go via Muhammad وسلم, or to any other prophets. I can pray directly to Allah. Yes? I have a direct connection with Allah. Jesus had a direct connection with his God. Do you have a direct connection with your God? No, you said you have to go through Jesus. You just said that. Because Jesus says it in the Bible, that's why I have to. No, Jesus said, when he was asked a specific question, how shall we pray? He said, hello, our Father in heaven, hello be thy name. He's praying directly to the Father, my friend. He didn't say, no, no, at that time when he was asked, how shall we pray? He did not say, in my name, hello be thy name. See what I mean? He says, our Father in heaven. He's, he's addressing the Father directly. And by the way, the term Father is the, is the term that was used by the Hebrews at that time to refer to God Almighty. Yes? It's like saying Master. Yes? Master of the worlds, we say sometimes, to God Almighty. Yes? Rabbul Alameen. Now, this is something that we have to understand that Jesus is directing his prayers directly to God Almighty. He never told them then that you have to go via my name or use my name 
when you pray to God. Yes, there are other passages which says that if you ask anything in my name, it will be provided. Yes, something like that. I'm not denying that. I'm saying when he was asked specifically how shall we pray, he always addressed the Father only. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So who is, who is the, once again, who is the only true God according to Jesus? According to Jesus Christ. Because it's the truth, see, I'm going to say the Father and the Son. Okay, so you're opposing Jesus Christ then. What you have just done there, how am I opposing Jesus? Because Jesus, according to John 17, 3, says the only true God is the Father. You're saying is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Whom do I believe, Jesus or you? Whom do you believe? Do you believe Jesus or your church? I believe Jesus, what he says. No, but you're opposing Jesus. You just literally said to me just now that the true God is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Am I right? Is, not, isn't that what I'm you believe? The Holy Spirit is God. I'm not saying that. Whether you say the Holy Spirit is God or not, the point is, whom did Jesus um, testify as the only true God? Not you, not me, not the church. Who did Jesus recognize only, as the only true God? Now you see there is an explicit passage I showed you, but you are denying that now. Why is that? Why do you deny explicit passages, my friend? It says, the, it says what? I, I can only get to the Father through Jesus Christ. Yeah, again, he's a middle man. You see, when you say through someone, Jesus is not the destination, do you agree? Jesus is just the way. Just like every prophet was the way. For example, yeah. if you were there during the time of Moses, and you did not abide by the way of Moses, then you would be a disbeliever. You see, you see what I mean? Even if you were a Jew, and you did not abide by the teaching of Moses, then you would be a disbeliever. So the way of Moses was to God again. Yes, the way of Abraham was to God Almighty. The way of Jesus Christ is to God Almighty. The way of every prophet and messenger is always to God Almighty. Because they were doing his work. Yeah, I've already agreed with you, my friend. I said, I said, Amen to that. Every prophet. So you're saying those prophets were not the way, the truth, and the life. Let me let me ask you this: If you were there in the time of Moses, if you did not follow his way, would you have the truth? And if you did not abide by the truth and the way of Moses' teaching, would you have eternal life? You wouldn't. You see what I mean? By that principle, every prophet and messenger who are who are appointed by God Almighty are the way, the truth, and the life. That's what it means, my friend. It doesn't mean Jesus is God. Where Jesus is clearly telling you that the only true God is the Father, you keep insisting what the church taught you. And I know it's not easy. I know it's not something that you can, right now, like within a few minutes or an hour or something, change your, your perspective and, and make a U-turn because this is what you have been indoctrinated since you were young. Yeah? You've been, you been a Christian all your life? Yeah, so you're... You have, you have been taught this, but you haven't looked at the Bible objectively to come to a conclusion that this wasn't, the Trinity is not the teaching of any of the prophets, including Jesus Christ. The Trinity is a church doctrine, 4th century. Yes? Because from the history of the church, it was in the Council of Constantinople where they established this in the year 381 CE. Constantinople, which is modern day um, Istanbul, Yes, that is where it was formulated and later on it was fine-tuned for another hundred two hundred years See what I mean it is you will never find the I'm not talking about the term Trinity But I'm talking about the teaching of the Trinity the concept of the Trinity that means the Father Son and the Holy Spirit are one God you'll not find that in the Bible my friend either in the Old Testament or the New What's literal? It doesn't, it doesn't need to be said the Holy Spirit is God. It doesn't say that. So why would you believe something that is not explicit? Why would you believe when there is an explicit passage, why you're believing something that is not even in the Bible or not even explicit? Should it not be the other way around? When something is clear, you accept it. When something is ambiguous, you use the explicit to interpret the ambiguous. That is the correct principle, my friend. So imagine this, if somebody tells you clearly that it is day now, and you say, no, the clouds are covering the sun. You see, so it might be evening, it might be night. Yes? But when you can clearly see the sun, even if it's behind the clouds or something, you know it is day, then you, you do not argue 
with anyone that it is now not day. When something is clear and explicit, you accept it, you acknowledge it. See what I mean? Now with regards to Jesus Christ, you know, when he says many things, as a human being, for example, Jesus, do you believe God can die? Okay. Can God be... Can God doesn't resurrect either. Because resurrection is only for those who die, not for those who never die. Jesus especially, he sits on the right hand of the Father. And even now he's coming back. Sorry, on the right, right hand of who? The Father. Good. So how many gods are there? One is in the throne, one is on his right hand. How many gods are there? There's not two gods there. So how many? No, you, tell, you told me on the right hand side of the Father. If, if I know that the Father is already God based on what Jesus testified. Yeah. Now you're saying on his right hand side. So even if he sits on his right hand, how does that make him God? You know the 12, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles will be sitting on the 12 thrones and they will be judging the tribes of Israel. Yes, this is in 1 John, I believe, in the epistle of John. Does that make them God just because they are sitting on thrones? And they will be judging. They will be actually judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Does anyone judge on the day of judgment other than God Almighty? Jesus. Yeah, but Jesus. what were the twelve tri what were the twelve disciples? They'll be judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So if Jesus is judging, the twelve tri uh, the twelve disciples are judging. Jesus is on the throne. The twelve uh, disciples are on the throne. Does that make the twelve disciples? And by the way, I showed you the passage where they are one as well, one with the Father, just like Jesus and the Father are one. They are all one with Him. So now you have fifteen in one from three in one. It's not saying that. I know it doesn't say three in one either, my friend. It doesn't say three in one either. The question still remains. If Jesus is not God, yes? And he never claims, by the way, he never explicitly stated that he's God. And the Father stated that he was God and Jesus testified that the Father is God. So we have double confirmation. One is confirmation from the Father himself and the second confirmation is from Jesus himself. Yes? Remember Jesus also says in John 5 that if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Imagine this. Can you imagine God testifying something and God is telling you his testimony is not true. But someone else testifies about me, the one who sent me. And his testimony is true. And who is that someone else? God Almighty. See what I mean? I can show you many explicit passages in the Bible which disqualifies Jesus as God Almighty. And Jesus will agree with me more than with the Trinitarian. But he, he came he came to earth yeah. sinless. Like he kept the law we couldn't keep. But sinless doesn't mean you're he was a woman of a virgin. Bro. You know John John the Baptist? What was his sin? Your Bible says from from the women who was born he was the best example, the best person, John. What was his sin? At least I can show you certain sins that Jesus committed in the Bible. Do you know that? What sins, what sins Jesus? Okay, do you believe racism is a sin? Is it a sin? Man-made, yes. Yeah. Do you, do you think insulting someone is a sin? Do you think offending someone is a sin? If it's, if it's just. Yeah. It's a sin. Well, you can't you can't justify certain offenses. Jesus. Certain Jesus insults. Jesus flipped over the table because so like people were in the church. They were doing. They were no, no, I'm not talking about the 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 money exchanges, where he actually uses a whip to whip them, yes, and to drive them out of the out of the synagogue, yes. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the uh, the Phoenician woman who comes to him, the Canaanite woman, yes, who comes to him in John 15, sorry, Matthew 15, and he says, uh, sorry, she wants him to help her with her daughter, but he doesn't respond to her. He, she keeps interrupting that teaching, Jesus, and the disciples finally say, why didn't you say something to her so she'll go away? And Jesus says, I've not come except for the Lordship of Israel. So remember, she's not an Israelite, she's from outside uh, Israelites, so she, the message is not for her. The message is for the people that he was teaching, the Jewish people. Yes? And then she still insists, and then Jesus says, I do not cast the bread of the children to the dogs. Who are the children here, and who are the dogs? The Jewish people, the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. Who are the dogs? No, the dogs are everybody else. 
The Gentiles. So if you were if you were at that time, you're not a Jew, I'm presuming, yeah? You're a Gentile. So if you were there at that time, you would be considered as a dog by Jesus himself. Based on your Bible, yeah? This is not in the Quran. This is in the Bible. So that's actually an insult to my messenger, to my Messiah, and to my prophet. That the Bible uses such examples, yes, which are immoral, even to today's standard, and even back then. Yes, because dogs are someone who are considered filthy, unclean. Yes? And in another passage, this, Jesus also uses this example, I think Matthew 7, 6, where he says, do not cause the pearls to the dogs and the swine. No, what he's trying to say, he says that, he's saying like, see how like, some will preach the gospel. And yeah, because they won't respect the holy. Do not give what is holy to the dogs and swine. Yeah, but like, if they get violent or aggressive or something like that. No, there's saying, nothing to do with violence. It's, it's a metaphoric, it's a, it's a figure of speech. Because something which is holy should not be given to someone who doesn't deserve it. Lest they trample it under the feet. And he refers to them as dogs and swines. And these at that time were mostly the Gentiles. Because for the Gentiles, this wasn't holy. The teaching of Jesus wasn't holy for them. He's saying that because some people will not listen. So he's saying, don't, don't spend your hours with them. Just walk away. Okay. So imagine you were a teacher. Yeah? You were teaching your students. And they don't listen to you. Would you call them dogs and swine? No, this is different. This is like... Exactly, this is different. Jesus should be above those people who would consider the Gentiles as dogs and swine. You see? By, by, believe, sorry, by behaving the same as the Jews of that time, the Jews who would despise the Gentiles and call them such terms, derogatory terms like dogs and swines, he is now lowering himself to their level of morality. Whereas he should be above as a teacher. Yes, he's a rabbi. He's a teacher. Bringing good news. To me, this looks like the same old news. Yeah, he called the Pharisees uh, uh, vipers and snakes and so on. I think those people deserved it. But, those, but, that is not to, but those people were actually Jews, you see? The Pharisees were Jews. But here, it, it actually is a form of racism. Because you're saying is the message is only for the Jews. Yes? Which is what he was asked to deliver. Say again? Yeah, Matthew 15. Open it and read. What's that? He's speaking to the whole world. No, he says, I've not come except for the Lordship of Israel. Are you the Lordship of Israel? Is that is that Canaanite woman a Lordship of Israel? No, she the reason he said to her this is to to make it clear that my message is not for you. But it's for the Bani Israel, for the children of Israel, the Jewish people, the Jewish tribes. See what I mean? Now, earlier you agreed with me that calling someone a derogatory name or, or, or racism is a sin. Over there, if you were objective, if you were looking objectively, you will acknowledge that was a sin on the part of Jesus Christ by calling a woman a dog. That to a woman who's literally begging him on her knees, begging him to help her child, who is either possessed or not well or something. So she's not asking for something. She believes in him, actually. She believes that he does miracles, that he can cure her, which he did, actually, eventually, after insulting her. Yes, you know what the woman said when Jesus says, I have not come except for the sheep of Israel, and I do not cause the bread of the children to the dogs. You know what she said as a response? Do you remember? Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall of the master's table. And to me, it seems like she was just desperate. She would be willing to become even a dog. Yes? To be condemned as a dog even. As long as he cured her child, she was willing to do that. You know what? Any mother would do that. If a mother was in the A&E and the A&E staff mistreated her, she would literally beg on her, on her knees if a child could be cured by that A&E department. And she would be live, willing to take any form of condemnation any form of racism even, any form of abuse, because her ultimate goal is that her child is cured. And she believes in the power and ability of Jesus Christ. Yeah, but he insulted her, my friend. Sorry, he insulted her. That's what I'm saying. A good teacher doesn't insult someone who's come for help. Yes? With such racist derogatory terms. And you see, you will not find such what he says, such insult to a prophet and a messenger and a messiah in the Quran. But it is in the Bible, unfortunately.
What does the Quran call Jesus blessed? Jesus, the Quran calls Jesus blessed. His mother is blessed. In fact, there's an entire chapter in the Quran called Surah Al Maryam. This chapter of Mary has been given this title, Mary, which is the mother of Jesus Christ. Yes? The number of times Jesus is mentioned in the Quran is more than the number of time of many prophets, including Prophet Muhammad by name. Yes? But by reference, obviously, Prophet Muhammad is mentioned many more times. So this is the respect that the Quran gives to Isa alayhi salam. To Isa, which is the name in Arabic of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. This is a respect and he's blessed in the Quran. I'll show you another passage in the Bible where he's actually condemned as a curse. Have you heard of that? Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. Open it. Galatians, yeah. Galatians 3.13 So this is not not a way, I'm not trying to like belittle you or Christianity as such. I'm saying if this book was truly from God, then it would not insult a prophet as a sinner, as a racist, and, and as a curse as well. Galatians 3, so it should be at the back. Yeah. Just look like this. Chapter 3, verse number 13. You to read it aloud? Yeah. Let me read it. Can you, I can barely hear you. Yeah. Christ had redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Yes? For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. You see, look what he's trying to say is uh, see how he's saying we pay the price for our sins on the cross. So when we ask Yeah, I know, I know. But he became a curse for you. Became a curse. It's not trying it says it's not trying to say, it literally says it. Shall I read it again? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. And then it goes on to say, for it is written, that means in the Old Testament. It is written that cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Paul here, who's written this, uh, this particular letter to the Galatians, he's interpreting the Old Testament, where he says that anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed, hangs on a pole is cursed, hangs on a cross here in this, in this scenario is cursed. So Jesus became a curse by taking the sins upon himself. Can you imagine someone who is blessed in the Quran, according to the Bible is cursed. Isn't that an insult to the person that you consider as God? Well, you can read it again and again. It won't change the fact that it becomes a curse. What is the misunderstanding? The people who wrote that Bible? Or, or Paul who interpreted it from the Old Testament? Who misunderstood it, my friend? I know it is something, it is, it is shocking for you to see, to see Jesus in the light, in such a light where he's condemned as a curse. I don't think you can say Okay, what does he say? You tell me, go on. You tell me what you understand from that verse where he says he becomes a curse. What do you understand? When does someone become a curse? You tell me. You know in the Quran who is cursed? All the time? Shaitan, exactly. Every time we read the Quran, we say, Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajim. Yes? That means we seek refuge in Allah from the Shaitan who is cursed. In the Bible, who's cursed? Jesus Christ, my messenger, my prophet, and my Messiah. Yes? And I find that quite often offensive, the way Jesus is portrayed in the Bible. So many, many churches and many Christians say that we love Jesus. But then the same book that they read, the same Bible they read, the same holy book that they read, has condemned him as a curse. Well, you can deny it, my friend, as much as you want. Why didn't you go and ask? So what, is, what does Galatians say then? He becomes a curse. So he, he redeemed you from the curse by becoming the curse. Do you understand what that means? That means he was the one on the cross he was insulted, he was spat upon, he was literally stripped naked, humiliated, and then eventually killed. If he was God by his own creation, in his own creation killing him.
God came as a man in the form of Jesus. God Christ. came as a man. In the form of Jesus Christ. Okay. That's why he he had he, he suffered the temptations we suffered, but he was sinless for us. Can God become a man? Yeah, if was if was if was to come in from anything he was here. Yeah. Open Hosea 9:11. Let's see if God can become a man. And also Numbers 23:19. Is the Old Testament, Hosea. Hosea 11, verse number 9. Alhamdulillah ala ni'mat al-Islam. Alhamdulillah for the blessing of Islam. We don't have these issues. Uh, 11. Verse number 9. Say 11, 9, right? Oh, from, by the way. Right? from the sun. No, he says the, uh, God is not uh, God is not a man. Uh, num numbers chapter. Num numbers chapter 11, 9. 23. Yeah, we got that as well. Numbers 23, 19. Oh, Hosea 11. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. That's more clear, I think. Hosea 11, 9. It's 11, 9, yeah. You want to read aloud, brother? Yeah. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of you. And I will not enter into the city. So I'm God, not a man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Now open Numbers 23, 19. So that is one place where it says that he is God and he's not man. And none of the Jewish people believe that God is a man. You see, the Old Testament, all the prophets, uh, 23, Numbers 23, 19. Is it 19? <laughs> Whose Bible is this? Mine. Yours, sir? Yeah. I just said I was small. You should upgrade it, it from KJV, man. That's what you Old do. English. <laughs> have you got a Bible on you? No? That's what I found. Yeah. I have. You got the NIV? Yeah. Can you read it aloud, brother? God is not man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Okay. Have you said and shall he not do it? Yes, yes, spoken. So God is not a man that he shall lie, he's not the son of man that he shall repent. Yeah, so he's referring to, referring to Jesus and he's saying God is Jesus called the son of man. Are you, so he's saying, but he's saying God is not a son of man. <laughs> Read aloud. <laughs> the second bit says he's not a son of man. So both ways you fail, my friend. He's not a man and he's not a son of man. Uh, okay. God is not a man that he should lie. Yeah. The son of man that exactly. he He's not a man, not a son of man. He's referring to different people. He's referring to no, he's referring to himself. He's saying God is not a man, means I am not a man. And God is not a son of man. In both cases, you see, Jesus was a man. He says neither. Exactly, he's neither. I, I totally agree with you. But Jesus was both. Jesus was a man and a son of man, according to the, the title he was given. So in both cases, based on Numbers 23, 19, he fails. He's referring to himself as Jesus saying man. Jesus is the son of man. Yeah, Jesus is son of man and Jesus is man. But God is saying, I'm not a man, I'm not a son of man. Complete opposite. He's not saying that. Okay, read it for the third time if you want to. Just like Galatians verse, he didn't want to believe it. This one also he doesn't believe. Because you see, these things are shocking for them. They've been taught by the church, a certain script. And when you show them certain passages in the Bible, which they have never learned, it's kind of shocking. It's unbelievable for them. And that's the reason this, this brother here keeps saying it's not, that's not what it means. But he reads it three times, it still means the same thing, my friend. The brother explained he brought everything in the book. He's right what he said. Everything was good. Because you have been indoctrinated by the church by reading only certain passages, and they haven't taught you these passages. That's why you are in a state of 
not only shock but of confusion as well because it, it opposes what you have been taught show me something that Islam teaches which even a, a child will understand like God is one we don't need to give him a philosophy lesson about the Trinity you see what I mean yeah. Some of the pages there as well. So, in Islam, the message is very simple. Yes, believe in Allah, believe in one God. Yes, no complexity there, oneness. Yeah, I totally agree. It's in the Bible as well, the same thing, believe in one God. But who complicates it for you, the church? The Trinity, like, a, like you have probably already realized, is not in the Bible. You think it is, but you cannot show me a passage in the Bible which advocates the Trinity explicitly. So what the Christians normally do is they say, oh, this passage says the Father is God. So let me put that in one side. This another passage, it says my Father and I are one. So hold on, that must mean that Jesus is also God. So now let me put that as well on one side, that Jesus is God. Another passage says the Holy Spirit seems like he's God as well. So you put that inside. So it's like a jigsaw puzzle you fit together and then come to the realization no it must be that they must be all three one god but that wasn't what jesus thought jesus explicitly says the father is the only true god but then you as a christian who claim to love jesus you oppose his teaching like the antichrist yes because that's exactly what the antichrist will be he'll be opposing the teaching of the true believers and the true prophets of god Look, you see Revelation, yeah. when Jesus comes back to take his people, it's so late this year. Say again? He says, when Jesus comes back to take his people, believe us, it says the Holy Spirit will go with them. So I'm not making this up. Yeah, but the Holy Spirit is not, you, do you believe that the Father is Spirit? Is yeah. the Father Spirit? Yeah. Is the Father Holy? Yeah. So the Father is the Holy Spirit, in that sense. Yeah, but it's exactly, that's why it's, it's not a separate person from the Father. Yeah, there you go, exactly. So, are you a Benitarian? You believe only two persons in, in the Godhead? No, I believe the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Exactly. So, you believe there are three persons, right? Jesus Christ is the Yeah. So, you believe Jesus Christ, sorry, the Father, Jesus Christ, or the Son, and the Holy Spirit are each distinct persons, right? <laughs> they are not one. How are they one? Show me how they are one when everywhere we see them as different. Show me how they are one. Gone. The Bible is in your hand. Show me from any passage in the Bible where it says these three are one. You won't be able to. You see what I mean? You see? That is the, the reality which you must acknowledge and accept. And you know why this is so serious? Because the day that we, that you and I will die is not far. We will eventually die one day. Yes? Before that day, I want you to accept and acknowledge the God of Jesus. Not Jesus as God, but the God of Jesus. The God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of all the prophets and messengers of God, the God of Muhammad Sallallahu We as Muslims, we call God Allah. Yeah? Do you know what is a term used by... Uh, do you know what was the language of Jesus? It was Aramaic. Yeah? So Jesus obviously communicated with the Jewish people as well, so he spoke Hebrew and Aramaic was his native language. You know what is the term for God in, in Aramaic? It's Allah. Oh, it is Allah means God. Yeah? The only thing that is different is the last vowel, which is different compared to Arabic. So Allah is a God and for Jesus it was Allah. What is the God what's the name of God in the New Testament? Father is not a name. You're a son. Is that your name? And you'll be a father one day. Would that be your name? Yahweh is Yahweh is not in the New Testament. Yeah, but Father is not a name. I asked you for the personal name. Yeah, I ask you for the personal name of God Almighty. Do you know what's his name? Has God blessed you with his name in the New Testament? Because he has blessed us with 99 names. How many names has he blessed you with? None. Zero. Zilch. Yeah, but why, why do people so use Yahweh nowadays? People can use what they want. Doesn't make it true. What did Jesus use? That was the question. 
Jesus must have called God in his language, either Father, Abba, or Allah. He never says Allah. Because that is in English. Obviously, you won't find it in that. But if you go to the Peshitta, which is the Aramaic Bible, you'll find Allah in there. In fact, if you go to the Arabic Bibles, you'll find the term Allah in there for God. Yes? The book of Genesis itself has maybe now a number of times where Allah is mentioned. Just the first page. So when you speak to your Arab Jew or an Arab Christian, they say, Inshallah, Alhamdulillah, you know, God willing. Yes? Glory be to God. They use the term Allah because that is how God is referenced in Arabic. Similarly, how God is referenced in Aramaic was Allah. Say again? You know the term You know the term God was in use during the time of Jesus because English came much later on. Does that mean God didn't exist? Of course he existed. But they referred to him in a different way, which is very close to the Arabic. Allah. Allah. I know you don't like it because it sounds very similar to Allah. You would rather it be called some, something else. But unfortunately, that is what Jesus' language was. And your Bible hasn't mentioned a single personal name of God. Either it was wiped out or it was replaced with other terms like Adonai or I don't know. God even. Adonai is again a reference. Yeah, sorry, it's a reference. It's a title. It's not a name. It's not a personal name. Yeah. Just like if you go to Spain, maybe they say Deus or something like that, you know, a different terminology for God. You, because you speak English, you use the term God. The French use Deus. Sorry? Deus. Yeah, but Father is not a personal name. Come on. Be frank with yourself, man. Jesus said to pray in the name of the Father. If you don't know the name, how are you going to pray in his name? Yes, so you pray in Jesus' name. No, Jesus said to pray in the name of the Father. Yes? He did say that. How are you going to pray in Jesus in the name of the Father when he hasn't when the name of the Father has probably been wiped out from your New Testament. Yeah, he's been erased. I don't know why. Maybe it sounded too similar to Allah. <laughs> it's just a theory, yeah? But you can deny that. But the fact is, you know, Allah gave us 99 names and you haven't been blessed a single name. Okay, anyway. So you see the Quran has been preserved to this day. Alhamdulillah. Do you think the Bible has been preserved? When they can wipe away the name of God, what else have they wiped out? I don't know if you have looked into the manuscripts of the Bible. I wouldn't blame you if you haven't because this is not something everyone goes into. But the, the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament that we have today, there are none from the first century. Zero manuscripts. Yeah, from the second century, it's just a fragment, just a fragment, like a credit card size fragment. And from third and fourth, we have more, but not the entire Bible, not the entire New Testament. According to one New Testament scholar, it's called Doc, Dr. Bart Ehrman. He says 94% of the New Testament is from the ninth century or beyond. Remember, ninth century, Dr. Bart Ehrman. He's actually a specialist. He used to be a Christian, by the way. But then he he left Christianity. No, he's, he's actually a scholar. He doesn't lie. He, he, he bases his uh, study on, on history. So what he does is he looks at the historic evidence of the manuscripts available. And, he, and by dating them, he's able to ascertain what part of the Bible is from which century. But one thing is confirmed by all scholars including Christian scholars, that from the first century you have nothing, zero manuscripts. So you don't have the oral tradition of memorization, you don't have the manuscripts, you don't have the chain of uh, 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 transmission. So how can you believe what Jesus said in the first century is exactly as it has been recorded in the New Testament you hold in your hand? If you don't have manuscripts, how will you, from the first century? 
Maybe they didn't find it at the first century. But it took to the night to find it. Say again? Maybe they didn't have it the night the first century. But on the next century, they actually found it. Yeah, but 9th century is 900 years after Jesus. Can you believe that? 900 years after Jesus, you have a gap of nearly a thousand years. How will you confirm what Jesus said in the first century based on documentation from the ninth century? You, we can't even remember what we said to each other once we exit this park this evening. Yes? Or maybe tomorrow. Or day after tomorrow. Maybe the recording might help. But you and I will forget. You see of much of what we what we talked about here. We are talking about nearly a thousand years of gap. And the same with the Old Testament, do you know? The, o the earliest manuscript of the Old Testament is from the Dead Sea Scrolls, I believe, which date to about 1200, 1200 years after Moses, more than a thousand years after, after Moses. Now you got a gap of nearly a thousand years in the case of Jesus and more than a thousand years in the case of Moses. There is no way this Bible that you hold in your hand can be confirmed what Moses said and what Jesus said during that time. So I can just, you know, all the passages we just read, I can just say they are all not reliable. Or what you mentioned is not reliable. I don't think the Bible did that. No, 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 did that. no, but how will you confirm that? Tell me. Without evidence, how will you confirm? Imagine you lost your birth certificate and there's no other uh, office here which can give you that original birth certificate. Will anyone accept your copy, the photocopy that you have produced from it? which is not the original because they always want to match the original with the copy so they can ascertain whether this is a true copy of the original. No one will say that this is a true copy of the original without looking at the original. Yeah? Yeah. Over time. So Quran, we have two, two modes of transmission. One is oral, which is the primary mode. So, for example, when, when Prophet Muhammad he, re, uh, he, he received the message of revelation from Allah through the angel Gabriel or Jibril as it's known in Arabic. Yes, he memorized that. And then he would convey that message of the Quran to his companions who would A, memorize it, B, record it as well in writing. So we have two modes of preservation. And not only this was recorded, which we actually have copies of today from the first century of Hijra, yes, from the first century of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, yes, but we also have this tradition, which is the primary mode of preservation, the oral tradition of memorization of the Quran. Yes? So it's, it's not like Chinese whispers, because many people think that Oh, it is like Chinese whisper. So if I tell you something and then you pass it on to someone else and you pass it on third, maybe 10 people down the line, that message has now been changed. That's called Chinese whispers, yeah? Where, you, where it's orally transmitted, but during the transmission, the message changes. The reason for that is something that doesn't apply to the Quran is because we don't have just one chain of transmission, like in the example I gave you, but we have multiple chains of attested transmission and they all agree with each other doesn't matter the geographic distance between the two chains so if I go from here to say South America today yes and I ask a person to recite Surat Al-Fatiha the opening chapter of the Quran yes he will recite it exactly as someone who would recite it in England so that is the mode of preservation orally and I've already shown you the mode of preservation through manuscript. So in Bir Birmingham uh, University, we have something called the Birmingham Manuscript of the Quran, which is like um, carbon dated from the period of the time of the Prophet Wasallam. Yes, there's a range of like uh, 50 years or something. So within the very close proximity, we have actual evidence of hard evidence of the manuscripts of the Quran and that manuscript when you read it it is exactly as the Quran that I would be holding in my hand today that is a level of uh, what do you say 
uh, of securing the preservation of the Quran. And you know what is the most important level of preservation, uh, securing the preservation of the Quran? Yes, it's where Allah Himself says in the Quran that He will preserve it. So if you open chapter 15, verse number 9, it says, um, is that the one? Where it says, is it 15:9? Yeah. Where it says, اليوم نحن نزلنا الذكر ونحن له لحافظون. It is we who have revealed the zikr, which is the Quran, and it is we who will preserve it, safeguard it. So Allah Himself guarantees the preservation because it, it is the last message to the last messenger, and there's going to be no more messengers to come after him, no more prophets to come after him to correct. You know what happened before, whenever, for example, when the Old Testament got corrupted and the Pharisees used to mispronounce it and misinterpret uh, it? Yes, Jesus came along. And he taught the people the correct message of Moses, the correct message of the Torah, because he knew it. So there was always this safety net of the next prophet to come and correct if anything was uh, misinterpreted or misrepresented by the previous uh, uh, by, by the previous generation. So the next prophet would come and correct them. But because there are no more messengers and prophets to come after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who is Khatim al Anbiya, who is the seal of the prophets, that means the last prophet, Allah himself took it upon him, upon him to now preserve the message of the Quran. And that is the reason we have today this several million people today. Yes, some say 17 or 18 million people today have memorized, committed the Quran entirely to memory. Yes, so regardless of what people like David Wood and Hatun and all destroy the Qurans, they can destroy all the Qurans, they can burn all the Qurans in the world. But there'll be millions of people who have it in the heart, which they'll never be able to get rid of. Yes, and this is the beauty of the Quran. You know the way the, way the Quran is recited is in a, melod in a melodious way. Yes, so it's very easy to... Uh, for example, when we were children, we used to have... Um, uh, what's it? Nursery rhymes that we used to memorize. And because they, they used to rhyme, and the teachers used to teach us in a melodious way, it was much easier to commit to memory. Yeah. Yes? Try memorizing the Bible. <laughs> it would be, be virtually impossible. Yes? Do you know anyone who has memorized the Bible? Even the New Testament. Yes? You barely find anyone. You know, today we have children as young as six years old. Six years old, literally, who have memorized the Quran from cover to cover. Yes? And well, how is that different? Well, exactly. You ask what you have to prove. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. If you got proof, let us know, inshallah. Okay? So, Uthman was, Uthman was how many years after Muhammad? Do you know that? Um, was it about 100 years? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this guy's a joker about life. Go do your research, brother, before you come in and embarrass yourself. Osman was a companion of the Prophet Muhammad. How can he come after 100 years? No, but you don't even know how long after Muhammad he came. That's a joke. Okay, go do your research before you come and embarrass yourself. So, Osman was a companion of the Prophet. He's the third caliph of Islam. Yes? Ten years. Even te uh, so, we, he was the one who saw Muhammad, learned it directly from him. So, when he said Osman's Quran, we have no problem with that. Because that was the Quran which was standardized in the Quraysh dialect. That's all it is. Okay? So, going back to what I'm saying is that children have memorized it. You know, every year we have um, Ramadan. You must have heard of Ramadan. You have Muslim friends, I'm assuming. Every year in Ramadan, we complete the entire Quran in the masjid, in the mosque. Yes? Apart from 2020, which was a bit weird because of the COVID and so on. Yes? But every year we have Hafiz or the people who have memorized the Quran. They have, uh, they read it during the Salah, during the Tarawi, the entire Quran, from cover to cover, over a period of 30 days. And you know, when the Imam makes a mistake in, the, in reciting the Quran, there'll be so many people who'll be able to correct him at the back, including children. Yes, there's actually many videos on, on, online where, where the father is uh, deliberately making mistakes when he's reciting the Quran. And, he, and his daughter, she's actually four years old. She's correcting him when he's reciting the Quran. It's a beautiful video, mashallah. I don't know the name, but I'm sure you'll find it on YouTube or somewhere. So this is how we encourage our children to safeguard the message of the Quran. Even though Allah himself, we have no doubt, will, will safeguard his book because he has promised it in the Quran. Such a promise you will not find in the Bible.
Nowhere in the Bible it says that this message is something that God will preserve or he takes it upon himself to guarantee his preservation. Not in the New Testament, not in the Old Testament. Why is that? Why is that? Because God did not intend for his preservation. Yeah? Because God was always renewing the message, even though the core message remains the same, which is believe in God. All the prophets thought that. Believe in the Day of Judgment, all the prophets thought that. Yes, believe in his books, the previous books, all the prophets thought that. Believe in the angels, again, all the prophets thought that. This is the core message of Islam. When we say Iman, the six articles of faith, Yes, So, Amana Billahi means belief in Allah, belief in God. Wamalaikati in his angels, Wakutubihi in his books, which means the revelations. Yes, Warusulihi in his messengers and prophets. Yes, Waliyaum al Akhir, which means the day of judgment. Wal Qada wal Qadr in the predestination. All the prophets, they taught this. This is the core message of Islam. If you do not believe in the six articles of faith, you are not a Muslim. Yes, and the five pillars of Islam. Again, belief in Allah, pray five times a day, uh, give the zakat, fast in the month of Ramadan, and go for Hajj. Now, this is specific to Islam only. No, the previous prophets also prayed. You know how Jesus prayed? Do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? It's like that man over there. Yes, look, he's going to put his forehead on the ground now. That is called prostration. He, he looked up in the sky. In the ground, the the ground. Yeah, but he also prostrated by falling on the floor with his face on the ground. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? Just like this man is praying in the Garden of Hyde Park, he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. What was he begging God to do? To take the cup away from him? Yes, let it be your will, not my will. Yes? How did he pray, my friend? He prayed the way he said, but how that guy is doing it. Yeah, which is what? Which is what? To put his forehead on his floor. Do you pray like that? Sometimes I'll do that. I'll no, no, why sometimes? Because you don't have to do that. Because he's praying to his father. You don't understand that. He's praying to his father. Are you going to interrupt? Yes. I don't want you to. Go away. Okay. Okay. The thing is, he's got a relationship to his father. Yeah. So, do you pray to the father like that? You put your you put your face on the floor and you pray to the Father. You can pray to God any way you want. Exactly. No, but would you would you not pray? Okay. Do you think it is important how Jesus prayed? Yes. Do you, do you think you know, brother, brother? Your ignore him, ignore him. He's a he's a troll. Ignore him. Okay. So what? By the way, I'm going to stick with you talking. If interrupts, we, we stop this, yeah? Because we don't like interruption. Okay. So what I'm saying is that if if Jesus prayed, please ignore. Okay. Je Jesus Christ puts his face on the floor and he prays. Yes. If you do it sometime, that's fine. But at least Jesus prayed that way. And we pray that way as well. Did, yeah. Do you know Abraham prayed that way? Do you know Moses prayed that way? Yes? All the prophets Abraham? prayed like that. Why? Why is that? Because the Salah which Allah gave to the Prophet Muhammad it wasn't something new to him. It was also how it was prayed before. So, so if, you, if you pray, look him up, what's going to happen? By the way, you know, in English the term prayer can mean several different things. It's a ritual prayer plus you uh, supplicating. Supplication to God, we can supplicate anyway. Yes, so we call in Arabic, we call that dua, which is supplication, which you can pray any way you want, in any in any position you want. Yes, even in your own language, doesn't matter. This is called supplication, but then there's a ritual five times prayer, which is different. So, in English, the same term, but in Arabic, it's called salah and dua. So, salah is Salah is the, uh, the ritual prayer and supplication or dua is, is the one is the one that uh, is a supplication. So Alhamdulillah what we say is that we pray to God and Jesus prayed to God. Does God pray to God? No. But according to you Jesus was God, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. According to you, Jesus Christ is God. Am I right? Does God pray to God? 
Jesus, he was doing that. He was teaching us how to God the Son prayed to God the Father. Good, so God prays to God. God the Son is God, according to you. God the Son is God, and God the Father is God. So God prays to God. So God is God. Yes? God the Father has a relationship with God the Son. Was that? God the Son has a relationship with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit has a relationship with God the Father. I can't hear you with that guy barking at the back. Okay, so... What I'm saying to you is that if Jesus is fully God and the Father is fully God, are you saying one God is praying to the other? They have a relationship, yes. They yes. Have what, what? They have a relationship of yes. master and slave, you're right. Yes. See, he, said, yes. like you're he said yes. Who was your Allah praying to with the angel? He wasn't praying Who to was him. Praying? Okay, anyway, going Who back to you. To? So he if Jesus that? is claiming that the only true God is the Father, John 7 in 3, then we know that he was considers the Father as the only true God. Only true God excludes everybody else. That is the Father, you're right, yeah. The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Moses. Let yeah. Him speak. You don't Wait. believe in those. Let him speak. So you pray. Believe in our love. Pray. No name. Please let him speak. Let him speak. You've got yeah. the other, he's got please. no name. Okay, anyway. You know what, brother? Brother, please. Bro bro brother. My brother, listen. Brother, there's people watching this. Okay. So, Alhamdulillah, he said to pray to the God of the Abraham, God of Moses, God of David. Okay. So anyway, let's let's take this up next time. We don't want people like him, guys. Let's move away from the troll. Yes. This is called a fanatic Christian. So, so there are two Christians over there. They want. Look, look, they, want, they don't want them, him to speak to me. So anyway, I think we, we covered most of the parts with that uh, brother. No problem at all. They know what they are doing. So apparently by, by barking like dog or whatever he's, that person is, a troll, he thinks he has rescued the other Christian by doing so. That's fine, but I think most of the message has already been delivered. Alhamdulillah. And we have come to an understanding between that uh, brother who was actually sincere and listening that the only true God, according to even the Bible, is the God of Jesus. And like that old man barking behind me clearly said, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of Jesus. Yes, that is exactly what the Muslims have been telling you all along. Pray to the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, God of Jesus and the God of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because that is the only true God, not the Trinity. So Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah khairan, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.